UFC middleweight, Brad Tavares, who is coming off a massive win last month against Omari Akhmedov to keep his top 15 ranking. Brad, how are, how are things with you today? Uh, going very well, you know, just getting my day started here in Las Vegas. Uh, so a bit behind you, I feel like your day's uh, about to end and my day's just beginning. <laughs> We are eight hours ahead of you, so it's it's in the evening today. But but I guess talking to you guys on the West Coast, it's, my day's always g- generally uh, towards the towards the latter stages. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Let's talk about it. As I mentioned, so last July, last July UFC 264, you defeated Omari Ahmedov via split decision. I think that would be yeah. my first question: is opinions on the on the split first and foremost. Oh, I mean, as you can see, when you're watching them read that decision, the second that they, they announce it, and I know it's going to be a split decision, I'm like, oh, I'm about to get ripped off, you know. I'm about, they're definitely, if they don't see me winning this this fight decisively, I'm about to get ripped off. That's all I'm thinking. So when they read my name, I'm like, whew, relief. You know, they got it right. But uh, yeah, so in the fight, I think in the even in the, the post-fight uh the interview, I said, oh, okay, you know, maybe they gave him the first round, whatever. Anyway, I went back and I watched the fight. Um, as soon as I finished all my medical and media um, obligations after the fight, I watched the fight as soon as we got back to uh, the hotel. And I, I was like, you know, like, I may be biased, but I feel like I won all three rounds. Like, I don't even feel like I dropped any of the rounds. So I'm like, and you know, at the end of the day, at least two of the, got, two of the three got it right. Um, and, and everything worked out. It's such a, I would, I've never been in a fight like as high magnitude as you, obviously, Brad, but I would imagine it's such a stressful scenario. What is it like? Can, can you contemplate when, when they're reading out the judges' um, decisions and you get the impression that it's a split decision? What is that feeling like for you? Um. Okay, so I guess I, I don't, like, I always feel, like, very confident in my fights. And there's been a few times in my career. Uh, one of them has been against uh, Tom Watson. I fought Tom Watson over in England. Um, and I felt like I won that fight decisively. And then they're reading the, the scorecards and it's a split decision. And I'm like, it's just, just anxiety because you're like, okay, how are they going to see this? You know, like I felt like I won the fight, but obviously somebody didn't think that you know and so it's in that moment you're like you're hanging on the edge of your seat really and you're just waiting to hear that you know once you hear that that beginning of your name then you know you got it but uh yeah it's a it's a lot of stress a lot of anxiety you know and it's it seems like a very long time like it seems really drawn out but it's a matter of seconds um and in that fight they actually messed up um and, and that's the type of things that don't go on, like, public record or these judges don't issue an apology. You know, uh, Herb Dean had actually come up to my coach, Ray Seffel, and told him, like, this may have been, like, a week or so later. And I was like, hey, you know, like, they actually found out that one of the judges put was marking the wrong scores uh, on the card. So he was marking my scores for, for Watson and Watson's scores for me. And that's why it came out to the split decision. And it's like, dude, imagine if, you know, one person, like, legit saw it for Tom. And then that guy who messed up, I would have got ripped off there. Then what? You know, do they ever own up to their mistake or what? So, very stressful. Very, very stressful. Can you imagine that scenario in any other sport? Could you imagine a American football game and one of the teams scored a touchdown or whatever and the points went to the other team? Could you imagine how incomprehensible that is? But in fighting it, things like that happen? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, there, there's, uh, there's definitely in other sports, American sports, there's times where, okay, it, it boils down to a referee, um, their decision, I guess, you know, like how they saw it or their opinion on the matter. But nothing doesn't even come close to how it is in fighting. I think maybe the closest that you could come is maybe like basketball, uh, American basketball. You the the referees have a lot of pull in that game you know they can really change the way a game is going on how they call a game so and there's been you know instances of corruption and whatnot but man in fighting is like you don't see it to the very end you know it's not like 
you can see the, the way the judge is scoring it. Like, I, I know in the past they've talked about that, like uh, live scoring, I think they call it, to where each fighter knows how the judge scored it at the end of the fight. Like, I think that's a great idea, you know, because at least if this guy is completely getting it wrong, at least you're aware of it. Mm. Like, you, you could feel like, oh, I won that round. And the, the judge scorecard comes back and says, this guy thinks he lost. You're like, what? All right, okay, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to fight harder. Okay, I fought harder. I feel like I won that round. And it comes back again. And he's like, oh. So then at least at that point, you know, okay, my back is against the wall here. I need to go out and just go all out, get a finish, whatever it may be. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, I think that would be a good idea. Well, that's certainly a, an option and probably the other, op- the most obvious option is we put more judges in. We put five judges or seven judges and the, hopefully the margin the margin for error would go down. But but obviously you got the got the right decision and, and nothing. You know, we never saw a robbery or anything like that. Or Yeah, that's yeah, it. for sure. How do you look back on, if we, if we move the conversation from the judging to performance, how do you look back on, on your performance in your last fight? Uh, Performance-wise... I'm I'm happy, you know, definitely there's always things that happen in the fight that was unexpected one way or the other, good or bad. Um, but I'm the type of fighter that I never like to be comfortable or complacent with, with anything. Like, I'll be happy with it. You know, I'm not going to be down about a, a good thing. But I also know that there's things that I can go back and fix. You know, there's like in the end of that fight, uh, I almost put him away. I had him hurt, caught him with an uppercut, hit him with a few hard shots. Um, so, you know, maybe there's things that we'll go back and, and look at uh, before the next fight and be like, okay, maybe if we do this, this, and this, then we can get that finish here or whatever. But I always believe that there's things that you can do better. There's things that you can fix. So I'm always trying to do those things, you know, stay ahead of the game. Um, keep myself evolving and changing and growing and adapting. So, yeah, that's how I look at it. I did want to ask you about this because after the fight, Ahmedov was released from his UFC yeah. contract. What is that like for you? Do you have any opinions on that? Uh, the fact that your opponents left the company after after that loss? Um, You know, it, like, it, it sucks because... So, Omari, Omari is a real nice guy. Mm-hmm. I, I've known him before we fought. Um, real cool guy. He and I both managed by the same person. So uh, we've run into each other in the past. And I, and I like the guy. You know, he's, he was nothing but respectful um, in the lead up to the fight, in the fight, and even after the fight. So it, it is, it does kind of suck, you know, like it, like you almost feel like you caused that. But at, at the end of the day, it's like, it, if you think about it, that could have been me on that chopping block. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I am where I am. Um, and over my career, that's not the first time, you know, my, this year, the, the two opponents that I have faced that were released, mm-hmm. uh, after we fought, um, shoe face got released after our fight in January and Omari got released after this fight. Um, with Omari, I was really surprised though. Yeah. He, uh, he has a good record. Um, it's not like he was coming off of like back to back or like, you know, two to three losses, how it usually happens. Usually a fighter goes three losses in a row, they get released. You kind of see that coming. So when I heard the news, I didn't think it was true at first. Um, but uh, yeah, it turns out it was. So, you know, I, I just wish the best for him and whatever the next venture is in his life. Um, and even if it's making his way back to the UFC, you know, I'm sure that he can do that. He's a talented guy. 100% couldn't agree more, but perhaps future opponents when they got off of, of the Brad Tavares fight might turn you down. In fear that they lose the job. <laughs> hey, maybe. Let's let's talk about that. Is obviously now number thirteen in the rankings and on this two fight win streak in twenty twenty one. Who are you looking to face next? Presumably, you want to move into the to the upper echelons of this division. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a lot of big fights happening or scheduled to happen right now, so kind of just got to see how that shakes out. Um, a person that. Uh, you know, I've had my eye on in the past is uh, Jack Hermanson. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if if the if everything lines up correctly and he doesn't have a fight and I don't have a fight and we can make that happen, that'd be great. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, whoever above me that I need to fight, um, I'll do it. 
of any of the scheduled fights above you, what one do you have your eye on the most? Is the one is it a match up in the middleweight division that's that's exciting to you? Oh, um, definitely Izzy and Whitaker too. And I just heard that that may be possibly postponed to next year, so that's gonna suck. But uh, yeah, that's I, I think as a fight fan, that's an exciting matchup. You know, like the first. The first time they fought, it was, it was a good fight and they quick, but I felt like uh, I felt like I knew what Whitaker was trying to do, but I just think he kind of went about it wrong, and I don't know what that might have been. You know, you never know what anybody is dealing with prior to a fight, but uh, I think this time around, I, I think he'll have made the changes, so I think it'll be a great fight. I, I'm very excited to watch that one. Obviously, having faced both Adesanya and Whitaker, do you have a preference in the rematch at all? Who, who are you leaning towards? I think, obviously, the favorite is going to be Izzy, um, just because of skill set and the momentum he's on. You know, his only fight is he went up to 205, and or his only loss, I should say, yeah. went up to 205, faced the champ there, came up short, you know, and it, it wasn't... It wasn't even by that much. It's not like he got stopped or destroyed, mm-hmm. any of that, you know. And and he's not even that big. Like, he's tall and long, but he's not, like, a real big, heavy guy, you know. So kind of like what you see with John Jones. Like it, 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 I'm sure if he went up, you know, put on a little bit of the weight and got used to the, the big boys, he probably would have done better in that fight. Um, Whitaker, on the other hand, like, ever since he lost to Izzy, you've seen him just – He's been on a tear. He's looked great, you know. He looked clean and crisp. And again, I'm sure he's going to make the proper changes. So I would say I think it's going to be a good fight. I think it's going to be much closer than the last one. Um, I can't even honestly pick a winner. But if I had to, I don't know, if I had to put money on it, slight edge to Izzy. Yeah. Very slight edge. The logical pick is Izzy, obviously, in a rematch when someone has won. But... To be quite honest, Whitaker has, has looked fantastic in the three fights since, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he has definitely. Something I want to wanted to mention as well, Brad, is your last two your two fights this year have come on on the Conor McGregor Dustin Poirier uh, <laughs> two fights. Uh, I, I had a little bit of a look. I didn't think there was another fighter other than them two who've, who've been on both cards. But what is that like for you? Do you like get being on a card where there's more eyeballs, more casual fans, and, and more exposure? Um, yeah, I, def- I definitely help. I, th- I think it helps, you know, um, it's not one of those things where I'm like trying to like rally for like, Hey, yeah. let me get on this card, you know, but the fact that it worked out that way, the fact that I was a part of such a big card, it's, it's definitely good for you. You know, um, you get people that there, what, what comes with a Conor McGregor card, you have, like you said, you know, like, like you have casual fans, people that don't even know the sport, people that still think that, oh, UFC is a sport. Oh, you fight UFC? Like, yeah. oh, yeah, I fight in the UFC. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you know, it's those type of people that tune in just to watch Conor McGregor, you know, and, and, and in doing that these last, this past year, Dustin Poirier has made himself a household name and he's starting to, to get that traction and flow and, you know, people are tuning in just to see him fight too, so... It's it's it always brings more attention, more eyeballs, um, and then other people get a chance to see you and become a fan um, that otherwise wouldn't have, you know. So it's it's always good. Yeah, it pr- probably one of them in your progression of your career and marketability. It's it's not going to hurt, for lack of a better yeah. phrase. Yeah, for sure. Something I wanted to ask you, Brad, as well is, and I've spoke to a lot of the guys out of the the great gym that is Extreme Couture and. Specifically, a lot of the Hawaiian guys, the likes of Dan, eh, Mahi, Kai Kamaka, Puni. And I, one of the questions I, I asked them was, why did you make the decision to move from Hawaii to, to Las Vegas? And every single person, every single Hawaiian fighter who I asked that question to said your name. <laughs> said, seriously, said it was Brad Tavares. He was the first one who made the move. And we kind of subsequently followed after his success. So... I've got to ask you, Brad, why did you decide to make the move to, to Extreme Couture in Las Vegas? So all credit for that specifically goes to my old coach, Brandon Wolf. Uh, if it wasn't for Brandon Wolf, 
I might not be where I am today. And all these other guys may not be here as well. <laughs> um, back in 2007, 2008, uh, our coach Brandon had come up with this plan. And back then, MMA was was blowing up. It was on the rise. You know, the Ultimate Fighter had happened and this and that. And, you know, the UFC was this big thing. As, but as far as, like, where the sport of MMA was in the country, it wasn't as big as it was like what i mean is today you can almost go to any city and especially any major city and find an mma gym and then you can almost find an mma gym with a ufc fighter that trains there yeah almost anywhere you go you know but back back then 2007 2008 2009 around that time there weren't a lot of big gyms extreme couture was one of them this was pre Vanderlei in Vegas, you know, yeah. prior to him opening up his gym. Um, I think Jackson's was there, American top team. You know, there wasn't all these huge, like there was just a few, a handful of gyms that was like, okay, you got to go here. You got to go there. Yeah. Um, but Vegas at that time was like the Mecca. Everybody was at Extreme Couture. Randy was still fighting. Um, you had Jay Heron, Martin Campman. Evan Dunham, Tyson Griffin, like Forrest Griffin, but like the who's who, Vanderlei was even there. Um, Akiyama, Matt Brown, like all of these guys were in Vegas training at Extreme Couture. So Brandon came up with this plan. Hey, in two years, the younger generation fighters, myself, um, the Hanson brothers, uh, Matt Como, all of these younger guys, he said, we're going to fight as much as we can here in Hawaii. Um, whatever island we have to go to, we're going to win all the belts that we can, whatever titles, recognition, just beat everybody. And then in two years, we're going to move to Vegas. Um, and he was really good friends with Mac Danzig. And Mac Danzig was at Couture's at the time. And back then, Couture's was really um, more of a fighter-only kind of exclusive gym to where if you wanted to come to pro practice, you had to personally be invited. And if you showed up and you weren't personally invited, you wouldn't be allowed on the mats. So, like, our pro practice in today is invite only, but it's kind of more of an open invite policy, you know, um, which, you know, is not, it's not a bad thing. I like it. It brings in new bodies. But back then, it was really, like, somebody had to personally say, hey, you can come to this practice. Yeah. And if they didn't, you weren't allowed to practice. Um, so, anyway, two years almost exactly two years from when Wolf came up with that. Um, I had a job. I was working for Hawaiian Airlines in Hawaii and a job transfer came up, opportunity came up. So I put in for it and they said, I got it. They rewarded the position to me. I asked them, okay, like, when do I have to beat her? They're like, oh, you have to beat her by next payrolls or next pay period, which is two weeks. I was like, damn. So I got to pack up my whole life and move to Vegas. And I was like, it was kind of stressful. I was like, I don't know where I'm going to stay. I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I have this job, but nothing else. Mm -hmm. Like, am I going to ship my car? My car, will it even make it there in time? This, that, whatever. So I ended up just packing up all my stuff. And I came up here with like, luckily I work for the airlines. I came up here with like 14 or 15 boxes of stuff. Crazy. <laughs> I had one friend that was living up here. He picked me up and I, he ended up right before I moved up, he ended up finding us uh a room to live in um we shared it we shared it for like the first couple months you know he and i split the room as whatever whatever we had to do to make it happen um yeah but that's what brought me to vegas and yeah and i guess like it's funny like i don't ever think of it like that i don't try to take credit for all of these guys coming here but in interviews like this keeps getting brought up and then it makes me realize like oh, okay maybe i really am you know like or was the doorway for these guys and possibly without wolf putting this in my head and putting me here essentially now these guys might have not been here so it's crazy how that all works Pachi Mix told me Extreme Couture should be called Hawaiian Top Team is that a, is that a fair <laughs> assessment? Oh, 100% you know like we started out it was funny like when I was there they had known um, a few like Hawaiians um, and there was a few in the gym but I was like one of the first ones on the bigger stage. Um, and then one of the, the more consistent ones, you know, that was there that made Couture's my home. 
Um, and in the beginning, we were a minority. You know, there was more of more Brazilians, more uh, Americans, more everything. Uh, and there was only a few of us Hawaiians on the mats. And now when you walk in there, there's a lot. So it's, it's fun, you know, it makes it feel like home. Um, <clears throat> and I think like, you know, like we're people from Hawaii, we're good people, you know, like we bring a good vibe. Um, we get along with everybody for the most part and we like to have fun. So I think we bring a good energy to the gym. I'm going to ask you a difficult question now. and I'm going to ask you to keep bias, by, try and keep biases out of it. Excluding Brad Tavares, give me a top five Hawaiian pound for pound in MMA. Top five. Top five. Um, okay. Uh, currently or all time? Currently. 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 Okay, currently. I was going to say, because the GOAT is BJ. Yeah, BJ BJ's Penn. right there at number one. If, if we're talking um, <clears throat> All right. No, so top. I would have to say Max. Max has to be number one. Yeah. Um, you know, like the things that he's done, like he's, he's already put himself in like living legend status. Um, so Max, um, I'm trying to think like Dan, yeah, Dan Ige. I'm, I'm trying to think if there's like any Hawaiian fighters that don't train with us that I'm missing. I don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, so Dan Ige, um, I would have to put Ray Cooper up there, especially. Yep. Especially with his win over Rory McDonald, I think that's huge. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and then we got to go with some champs. Uh, Ilima Le. Yeah. Uh, you know, what she's done. And, um, and you know what? I'll, I'll save the fifth pick for, for a brother and sister, the, the Lees over in 1FC. Yeah. You know, so there's, they've done great things there. And, you know, even though they're not in the UFC and I think a lot of the mainstream people don't even know who they are, but you cannot discredit the, the work they've put in and what they've accomplished. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good pound for pounds, although there is six there, Brad, so yeah. who, who's, going, that, that, who's going off we, of the Lee siblings? We, we, yeah, Lee siblings can take the la- the, <laughs> okay. the, a spot. They can share it. Yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> what? They're tied. They're tied for yeah, they're tied, they're tied for the spot. I think that's a good pound for pound list. Max, Dan, Ray Cooper, Liam Malay, and then the, the Lee, the Lee siblings. Yeah. Well, for one final question, I want to turn the conversation back to yourself. We're obviously in August 2021. Where do you want to where do you where do you want your career to be within the next 12 months? What what position do you want to be end of August 2022? Uh, you know, um, hopefully a year from now. I, you know, it's all about that, that next fight. So hopefully I can line them on. A, I've, I've got two now. I'm sitting, you know, in the top 15. I think maybe two or three more fights could put me right up there at the top, um, depending how these other top fights shake out and what happens there. Uh, so <clears throat> hopefully right at a year from now, right at fighting, knocking at the door to, to fight for that title. Superb. Well, I very much thank you for your time today and I very much look forward to seeing you back in action in the, in the near yeah. future. Thank you for having me. And again, I'm sorry it took so long for me to get back to you, you know, I'm terrible with these type of things. Not a problem, not a problem. Before we finish, Brad, how can people find you on social media? Uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at Brad Tavares. Um, I'm on Instagram at Brad Tavares 808. And that's about it. There's a Facebook Brad Tavares. That's a fake dude. So <laughs> now you know. <laughs> And for one final question, Nick, the floor is yours. If you have anything you would like to, to say or sign off with. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you for everybody who's watching this, tuning in. Uh, thank you guys for the support. Um, and aloha. Great way to end. Thanks, brother. All right, Mike.